Our forum is moderated tonight by Dr. Sasha Helper. Sasha is a child psychiatrist with a private practice in Greater Boston, and she is herself a writer. Her columns appear regularly in Psychiatric Times. And after our speaker's introductory remarks, and I think Elisa has a reading for you as well, Sasha will open the dialogue with some questions of her own. After these initial questions, she'll open the discussion to include everybody in the audience. Here's our moderator to introduce our program and our speakers. So thank you for coming and welcome to the Cambridge Forum. Um, and today we're discussing when doctors are writers and Alyssa Eli and Tess Gerritsen are our guests and I am Sasha Helper, the child psychiatrist and essayist. Um, medicine's a very demanding field and writing is as well. Um, and yet many of us in medicine try to combine both um, authorship and doctoring. Um, the discussion that I'd like to have generated tonight is to look at what drives people to forge together the writing aspect of their imagination and their intellect and being a doctor. And I also want to look at how writing affects the practice of medicine, that if you're a writer, are you a different kind of doctor? And also if you're a doctor, are you a different kind of writer? Um, I will have questions of both Tess and Alyssa um, both are doctor writers, although Tess, after working for five years as an internist, um, left medicine to become a full-time writer. Um, Alyssa is a psychiatrist. She went to Harvard Med School and then trained at Cambridge Hospital and currently continues to work in the field of psychiatry, working with the severely mentally ill. And she writes columns, she writes memoir pieces, and she is a commentator for NPR, as far as I know, correct? <laughs> um, and Tess continues to put out one medical murder mystery after another. Um, Tess trained at University of California in San Francisco, and on a maternity leave, when she had a bit more time with a little baby, she wrote suspense novels and then turned to medical murder mil uh, thrillers. Uh, the first one was Harvest, and the, the most recent is called The Keepsake. So welcome to the Cambridge Forum, the audience, and Tess and Alyssa. Um, so uh, let's see, Tess, you're going to start. Okay. Thank you. For the purpose of the radio audience, I will say that my name is Tess Garretts, and I am not going to read. I want to make some introductory remarks about the topic itself, and in particular the topic of intersection of medicine and fiction writing, because it's fiction that I write, not nonfiction. How does being a doctor influence one's ability as a storyteller? I've always been interested in this topic. Um, it would seem uh, just on the surface that medicine is a natural training ground for a storyteller. Um, there's such a source of rich and dramatic material in a hospital. Um, people find their worst days and their best days in hospitals. We go there for the birth of our children, uh, and we go there when somebody we love really dies. I can't think of a better place to find dramas played out every single day. There are two occupations, I think that lead to this sort of um, ability to, to watch drama played out in real life. One of them is the medical field, and the other is the field of being a police officer. So uh, this may explain the popularity of so much fiction featuring cops and docs. And I always say, you know, it's, is it a cop or doc book? And you know that that automatically has its audience. And indeed, there are, of course, a number of physician authors very well-known ones. Um, we can all think of a couple off the top of our heads, um, Chekhov, William Carlos Williams, uh, Conan Doyle, and, and Michael Crichton. In fact, you will find a list of them in Wikipedia, just under the list of physician criminals. <laughs> Ironically, the two lists look about the same size. 
Um, but when you start adding popular fiction um, writers who are physicians today, uh, and you look at thriller writers in particular, that list gets a little bit longer. Uh, you have to add Robin Cook and Michael Palmer um, and um, Leonard Goldberg and F. Paul Wilson. I suspect there are a number of physicians out there who want to write books, but when you look at the overall list of who's writing popular fiction, it's lawyers who, who really dominate um, the, uh, the, the bestseller lists. Um, not for lack of enthusiasm do doctors not publish. We all know probably of a physician, or we've all gone to the doctor's office, and maybe we're in, or the dentist's office, and you're sitting in the dental chair with your mouth open, and you're lying on the gynecologic table, and you hear your doctor or your dentist say, I always wanted to write a book. Um, it seems that it is rampant among the, the medical profession, but it's just a reflection of what the overall population is feeling right now. There was a study that looked at a thousand people across America and ask them, how many of you have a book in you? 82%. <laughs> that study also estimated that probably 2% of the American population has actually written a manuscript, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So everybody wants to be a writer. Um, the fact that there are a lot of doctors who want to be writers has, always, uh, has almost become a joke in New York City. You'll hear a lot of thriller novelists complain about all these doctors who want to come in and, and, and take over the joint. There is a joke in New York City publishing that publishers have two kinds of rejection letters, one for doctors and the other for everybody else. Um, with so many doctors wanting to write, why aren't more actually getting published? Why are we not at the level of lawyer authors? Um, they have access to great material. What is the problem? Well, the first is, of course, a practical reason, and that is medicine tends to be a fairly lucrative profession. Very few really want to give that up to write and uh, have a profession in which there's a less secure income. But I think there's a more fundamental reason why more doctors aren't being published as storytellers. Uh, and it has to do both with our personalities and with our medical education. Now, once a year for the last eight years, I have taught a course uh, in Cape Cod, uh, Cod for physicians who want to be novelists. And I teach this uh, with Michael Palmer, who is another doctor novelist. Um, and it has only reinforced my impressions of, of how hard it is to be a doctor and become a writer. Now, our students, and, and every year we'll get up to maybe 200 uh, doctors signing up for this course. These doctors, of course, as you would expect, are intelligent. They are high achievers. They learn quickly. They understand grammar and the principles of plot and point of view. They are a very highly selective group of people, but I find that they are more, no more likely to be good storytellers than is any random group of writing students. And that is a surprise to these doctors because they've gone through life earning straight A's, and they are shocked when they receive their first rejection letter from some 25-year-old New York editor who's just gotten out of, you know, gotten her master's degree. In many ways, our medical training works against us as storytellers. Science is objective. Scientific writing is told in the passive voice. For instance, in a medical chart, we would write, an incision was made. We would never say, he slit the skin. Doctors are also professional explainers. We give advice. We do a lot of telling, not showing. In contrast, writing a novel requires us to be emotional, to write in the active voice, and to show and not tell. It asks us to ditch our intellectualism and strive for emotionalism, which is something we are really not supposed to do as clinicians. Now, as a writer, I know a number of successful novelists, and very few of them have advanced degrees. Some never attended college. Were you to measure their intelligence by IQ tests, you'd find that they're probably pretty bright people, and some of them may be brilliant. But in the game of IQ tests, the doctors will probably outscore them. Part of this, of course, is the nature of the tests themselves and what they measure, while logic and mathematical skills will boost your IQ scores, those skills count for very little when you sit down to tell a story. Novelists perform their job very well without them. So I contend that it's scientific uh, education and scientific thinking 
may be an impediment to writing fiction because fiction in essence is about making up stuff. It's about lying. It's about imagining events that have never happened and it is ignoring the logical in many cases. Most of all, fiction is about drama and about emotions. And here again is where so many of my very intelligent doctor students are at a disadvantage. I, I want to make an exception, however, for my psychiat psychiatric colleagues because they are far more adept at, at focusing on emotions. But most MDs are logical people trained to be objective and not to embellish or exaggerate or make up stuff. Now, on a more personal note, I have a, a little bit of time. I just wanted to talk about my own journey about how I got from you know, being a doctor to being a writer. Well, it actually went the other way. I started off as a writer. I wrote my first book when I was seven years old. Um, and when I talk to, to successful novelists, I find this is a very, very common age. A lot of them will say they knew they were storytellers when they were around seven or eight. And that's about the time when we learned to spell. It's a time we really learned the skills to be a writer, but we knew immediately that that was what we wanted to be. But I also had um, an early and somewhat geeky interest in science and biology, in particular weird biology. Because I grew up in movie theaters, my mother loved horror films, and <laughs> I spent my childhood screaming in movie theaters. So um, that could, kind of goes along with my interest in weird biology, and I spent my childhood also in the canyon near our San Diego house finding dead animals and cutting them up. Um, so I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be a doctor, and I told my father that. And my father, being a second-generation Chinese-American, uh, being also very practical, told me, you'll never make a living as a writer. Uh, and I was telling Sasha also that this makes a great topic for a future Cambridge forum. How do cultural pressures lead to, for us, lead to us choosing our occupations? Um, I chose my occupation of medicine mainly because my Chinese-American father told me I had to. Uh, and, and I also find that you know, there are a lot of uh, very unhappy Chinese engineers, Chinese doctors, who wanted to be fashion designers instead. Um, but even as a physician, I never stopped writing. I, I was writing both nonfiction and short stories. Um, but I always kept medicine and fiction separate. In fact, my earliest novels, which were romantic suspense novels, had nothing to do with doctors. My characters were spies, they were cops, they were cat burglars. I never even told my literary agent I was a doctor because I felt it was irrelevant. I had two different lives. But then I got an idea uh, when I was talking to a police officer who um, had quit being a homicide cop and was traveling in Russia and came home with a story that shocked me. Uh, he said that the cops in Moscow said there were children vanishing from the streets of Moscow, and they were convinced these kids were being shipped to the Middle East as organ donors. I was horrified by that idea. I don't think there's a person, a parent certainly, who would not be horrified by that, and I knew I wanted to write this book. I knew it was going to be not a romance, it was going to be about medicine, it was going to be about transplant surgery and the ethics of transplant surgery and matching organs, and uh, my character was going to be a, a, a physician, she was going to be a surgical resident, and I told my literary agent, I have a great idea for a medical thriller. And she said, uh, it sounds like a good idea, but um, we cannot sell a medical thriller unless it's written by a doctor. <laughs> and I said, there's something I haven't told you. I am a physician, and she said, why the hell haven't you been writing medical thrillers? <laughs> um, that was the point when I realized that my medical training actually is relevant to fiction. And I've also learned over time that the reason medical fiction is so popular with uh, the audience and sells so many copies is that we as doctors can tell secrets. Everybody wants to know a secret. Um, I can tell them what goes on behind the operating room doors, behind the autopsy room doors. People want to know how doctors think, what they see. They want to know our secret handshake. I haven't told them that yet. Um, so that um, was really how I ended up going into medical thrillers. I started off my journey as a writer, went to become a doctor, and ended up learning to integrate the two, which is uh, something that I should have done a long time ago, but uh, had to be kind of pushed into it by an amazing idea that wouldn't let me go. Um, so in closing with this, this remark, I just want to say that doctors 
can use medicine to enrich their stories, uh, to add scientific detail, and to open the doors to a secret world. But I'm not certain, I think that medical training actually, in and of itself, does not make one a storyteller. I think you have to start off with that to begin with. Thank you. Um, Tess, before we have Alyssa speak, I, as an outgrowth of your in, uh, introductory remarks, I'm wondering if the fact that you write mysteries and have to put together a database of clues to solve the mystery, if you think that that may be useful to, in the direction of going from writer to doctor, that it would make the doctor um, a better clinician because he has to put clues together or she has to put clues together to make the diagnosis. I think that I use a different part of my brain for that. Okay. Uh, because I, I do not approach plot, plotting in a methodical way. I'm a, uh, what we'd call a seat of the pantser. I just sort of jump in and see where the story's taking me. So um, I can't say that I have ever done it in a logical manner. Mm -hmm. And it leads to all kinds of trouble in the middle of the book. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the, only way, it's the only way I know how to write. Okay. But uh, in the, being in the field and having had the experience of being a doctor and a writer, um, would you suggest adding a course in murder mystery writing to the curriculum, the medical education <laughs> curriculum? Uh, uh, no, we don't need the competition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Then I'd like to introduce Alyssa Eli and ask that she do a reading. Hello. These are a few pieces from over the last 30 years. Uncle Herbert. I happen to be a doctor who faints at the thought of death. Through most of medical school, I dragged a chair behind me into patients' rooms. The moment always came when the blood would drop to my toes. This is my professional burden, but it's not my doing. I inherited the behavior. My Uncle Herbert lived his long and healthful life in active dread of imminent death and everything else. Early childhood memories are of visiting Uncle Herbert in Texas, watching him search himself for signs of exotic illnesses he never contracted. He began and ended each day with 20 minutes of floor exercises and two bananas. <laughs> a judicious combination that kept him on the far side of a crank-up bed for most of his life. At an age when statistics show the average senior citizen is on seven medications, he was still on fruit. <laughs> I remember visiting him the day he died. I a he asked if I was faint. I said no, gripping the rail of the hospital bed. I asked if he was afraid. He said no, gripping my hand. I don't know why we agreed to lie when we had so much in common. In the career of a fainter, there is often a transcendent opportunity. Some familiar abandoned ship situation arises when it is possible for the first and perhaps only time to surprise oneself, to remain cool, alert, and standing, to set sail with an unbent mast. Uncle Herbert's ship spread its sail once and only once. He never told anyone of his voyage, and if my mother hadn't been there when the ship docked, no one would ever have known it left port. We flew often from New England to Texas to visit the family. Then my father became ill. Trips west grew less frequent as he grew frailer. Eventually, his commute was no farther than from the bedroom to an armchair. In response, a stream of travelers, like a team of wagon trains rolling backwards, began to make its way west to east. Multitudes of Texan relatives arrived at our house, unloaded, stayed a few days, visited the man in the armchair, then bound their belongings back under the wagon wheels and turned their horses west again. Uncle Herbert was not among them. It was too far for him. He was a fearful traveler. He had a dread of East Coast microbes. <laughs> he, he suffered for his absence, but had no control over his terrors. When my father made one last trip to the cancer hospital, 
It was understood he would travel no farther. Visitors from the West dwindled. Contact on all sides was too hard. One morning, Uncle Herbert saddled up his station wagon and drove to the Dallas airport. He took a flight to New York, a cab to Grand Central Station, and a bus to the cancer hospital. My mother says he appeared in the doorway with his hat in hand, tall, upright, suffering from a hundred fears and a thousand diseases. Just wanted to see ya, he said to my father. He pulled a chair up to the bed. He sat down. He stayed several hours. He said next to nothing. Then he got up, took a cab back to the airport, and a flight back to Texas. He was home by dark. In the lives of the very fearful, there are these moments when intentions are suddenly, wildly, transcendently possible. The ship sets sail with an unbent mast. These moments are the opposite of nothing. These moments are everything. Mr. L. The patient barely hears, barely sees, and drools with such abundance it doesn't matter whether he's wearing his teeth or not. Though he's been institutionalized for decades, it's only in the past few years after newer antipsychotic medications that he's able to sit in conversation without panic or internal preoccupation. His thoughts are relevant, his worries high-minded. At times, a certain elitism takes hold. One day, he wheeled himself into rounds. The various courses of his lunch were on his shirt. I worry about the personality of the common man, he said. Can it be improved, we hollered. With prodding, he said. The next week, he returned. A different shirt and pants were covered with breakfast. I worry that I have no family to make amends. Amends for what, we yelled. For loneliness. Amends should be made to you, we yelled. Life has not been happy. He thought that over. Maybe we can get closer to what we mean by happiness, he said. The next week, a third shirt had the same meal themes. He'd just come from a concert organized by the ward psychologist. Simplicity is best, he said. That concert was disgraceful. <laughs> we were not surprised to hear it. But he added a surprising coda to explain himself. You see, he said, you think clearly when you have money. It happened that he did have money. In some murky but essential part of his past, someone had made him the beneficiary of a small trust fund. His psychosis had left it unusable for years. But recently, his lawyer had contacted us to encourage him to spend it. The staff decided to take him clothes shopping. There was great anticipation of the trip on both sides of the wheelchair. Logistics were planned for weeks by nurses who, choosing to go, would need to work doubly hard afterwards, catching up on paperwork they'd missed. I myself was not there. It couldn't be justified from the billing standpoint. Someone said that morning they noticed a long white limo pulling out of the hospital driveway. It was gone for about six hours. It slid through traffic into downtown crossing and waited while purchases were made from several fine men's departments. Then it slid back towards the interstate. I was told that the celebrity inside was asleep by then. Our team met the next day. We usually see this patient at one o'clock, but we were running late with a crisis. I could hear him complaining on the other side of the door. I insisted on a woman psychiatrist, he said loudly, and now I want to see her. It was 1.45 before we let him in. Think of the runways in Milan, Paris, the spokesmodels for Gucci, Versace, Laurent, Klein, the high traditions of fashion. Our man was wearing a sky blue sports jacket. A grass green polo shirt underneath was buttoned to the Adam's apple. Pants were cuffed, there were wingtip shoes and athletic socks. <laughs> a Burberry cap sat on his head, and though it was raining outside and dark in the room, he wore a pair of Ray-Bans. <laughs> the entire effect was electrifying. The nurse and social worker were beaming. You look spectacular, someone yelled at him. He looked down at his own magnificent self. 
Simplicity is always best, he said. <laughs> Lammy. Midnight. From the baby's room, a sudden scream. It sounds like catastrophe. In the light of a 10-watt turtle, she is standing in her crib, holding onto the bars, trying to peer over them. Real water runs down her cheeks. Lammy, her soulmate, her partner in the short journey of life so far, her man, lies on the floor on the other side of the room, hurled from the crib again. We don't know why she sent him soaring, whether it was love or anger. His snowy legs are up in the air. The ribbon around his neck, so satisfying to munch on, is moist from sampling. One white ear is black from fingering. We pick him up, not by a hoof or the end of his ribbon, which would be disrespectful, but tenderly in all our arms. Ceremoniously, we carry him across the room. She sees him approaching and cries harder. These tears have a different tenor, though. These are the tears that greet a returning soldier, tears of relieved hysteria. The war is over. He's alive. Lammy survived. It's been so long. Decades since bedtime when the two of them were lifted into the crib together. Millennia since the car ride this morning when he took a staunch position on top of her seat-belted thighs. A million years since he was sneaked into the washing machine last week. She holds out her arms and topples backwards, but there are no tears for herself. Lammy is coming home. We reunite them. She embraces his lopsided self. She sticks her fingers in his eyes and his ears. She coos something to him in his native tongue, which happens to be hers as well. <laughs> this love talk is none of our business. She lies down and pulls him beside her. They're almost the same length. Her eyes flicker up at us and around the familiar room. Then they settle on Lammy and begin to close. When she's asleep, we pull a quilt over the two of them. With luck, Lammy will survive until dawn before she hurls him out of the crib again. He is a beloved victim, and this is his arduous fate. <laughs> board examinations. The dreaded national board examinations require deep breathing, prescription drugs, and intensive relaxation techniques for the psychiatrist. An unknown patient appears. Within 30 minutes in front of three judges, you must tease out his history, establish rapport, and determine risk of harm to self and others. Your tone must be investigational but welcoming. Your interview must be guided but spontaneous. The porridge must be just right. <laughs> then comes another 30 minutes to make the presentation with differential diagnosis and treatment options. Judges interrupt with questions, and a whiff of execution hangs over the whole experience. Six weeks follow while you wait to see if you're dead or alive. <laughs> Candidates from all over the country converge in the same city. In an elevator full of doctors heading to the patient floor, I found myself standing behind someone I hadn't seen since medical school. He was finishing a prestigious training program on the West Coast. I'd never liked him. He was too fond of his thoughts. His theories were too easy. His suit was too tight. It's prudent to test drive your clothing before you wear them into board examinations, but apparently he hadn't ridden his suit around the block. When a piece of paper fell from his pocket and he bent down, we all heard the rip. <laughs> he faced front, and I could see the source of ventilation clearly. His seat was widening with each breath. He turned around and blanched, just like in the cookbooks. <laughs> Immediately, our elevator full of doctors without board certification went into action. A man's life was on the line. No one pounded on his chest, but one remarkable woman had a box of safety pins. She withdrew to the rear of the panic-stricken victim, dropped to her knees, and proceeded to initiate a surgical intervention. <laughs> When the elevator doors opened, my colleague limped to the men's room. The rest of us sat on chairs in the waiting room, checking our seams as destiny approached. <laughs> I was called to meet mine before he returned. You don't know what happens to other candidates after the test is over. 
I assume the woman with the safety pins passed with flying colors. She was a visionary. <laughs> the doctor held together by her pins fled back across the country. Ten years later, I'm still curious to know how he did. We never met again, but since I saw so much of him, I've liked him a lot better. <laughs> And finally, grace. I was sitting alone in the day hall, which doubles as a TV lounge and group room. No one had shown up for the morning Bible studies group. I was using King James for a clipboard, doing paperwork. Someone stumbled into the room. He was the width of a shoelace, so translucent that if the room were dark, you could see his spine through his chest. He glanced around, found the TV, made his way over unsteadily, turned it on, and fell into a chair next to me. He seemed to have an expectant expression. We'd been on the same unit for almost ten years. This was his home, the place where he rubbed feces on the shower walls and the nurses tenderly combed food out of his beard. They loved him through incontinence and flying fists, hallucinations and incoherence, and other forms of suffering without knowable content. Over the years, there had been periods of compulsive behaviors no one could make sense of, drinking nothing but milk or speaking one phrase over and over. The tick of the moment was turning on the television. Staff would find him before dawn or in the middle of the night stumbling to the TV room. Turning it off after he had turned it on was just asking for therapeutic trouble. The two of us sat next to each other. A rerun had begun. It was an episode from a series about a family full of disoriented love. They were always forgetting each other in the airport or confusing important visitors with repairmen. In 10 years, the patient had never called me by my name and there was no indication that I had ever entered his orbit of recognition. And yet he had, I felt again, an expectant expression. Slowly it occurred to me that he had stumbled down the hall not only for the television, but also for the Bible group. The soundtrack was very loud. Would you like to read the Bible today? I shouted. Should we turn down the TV? No, he said. We watched together for a minute. The littlest member of the family was off on a spunky adventure. Her father would discover her missing just before the commercial. Father and daughter would fall into each other's arms before the credits. Old Testament or new, I yelled. Old, he said. I opened King James to the Psalms and began to search. I was mulling options when he leaned over and started to read out loud. I didn't know he could. The earth is the Lord's, he read. He hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. The next line cried out for crescendo. I took over. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, I yelled. I waited a few seconds, then repeated his cue. You shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, I yelled. You have grace in you. Now it was his turn. He'd picked this psalm himself, but apparently he didn't believe what he'd heard or else that grace applied to him. He made a sound like someone in a cage who's been poked. You have grace in you, I repeated. He folded his fingers, tremorous and tobacco-stained. Then he bowed. This is the valley of the shadow of death, he said. His face was full of feeling. Thin he was and translucent, but not penetrable. TV credits were rolling above us, which meant the group like the sitcom was over. I started to fill out his mandatory participation form. Standing with his hands in prayer, he mumbled something. I thought I heard it right. He said, will you come again, reverend? I will, I said. It will do us both good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alyssa. I had a question that grows out of your readings. 
I was wondering when you sit with patients, do you immediately begin to feel, I want to write about this? Or as you process what's happened between you and the person and think about it and live with it, at that point or some point along the way, it strikes you, this is something I must write about. I used to carry a notebook with me um, in medical school along with chocolate bars and bananas and stethoscope. Um, and I wrote vigorously and frequently and very responsibly about absolutely everything that I saw and heard. I don't know if the same was, was true for you, Tess. And um, over the years, with deterioration of body and mind, the notebooks have been replaced by little scraps of paper that I carry around. And I don't write everything that I see and hear anymore. I've become very selective about what strikes me. Um, but what I have learned is that when I apply a certain evenly hovering kind of attention, I know it when I hear it. And it's, it's really that, that simple for me. Okay. So I do want to welcome everybody again to the Cambridge Forum and thank Alyssa and Tess. And since I'm the moderator, I have the good luck to be able to ask the first few questions. <laughs> so um, I'd like to move to my questions. Um, and some Tess has already answered. Um, I actually started writing in 1985 when I was frustrated with a managed care company. And I decided to write an essay about how managed care was impacting on my care of patients. And the essay got published, and I felt exhilarated. And I also felt that my ideas somehow were reaching a broad audience and I didn't stop writing. I decided to keep going, and it's just been a wonderful part of my life. And that brought me to thinking of this conference of doctors who write. Um, so now I'll go to some questions for the two of you. Um, so I did wonder, both of you, Tess and Alyssa, what books did you read as children? What are your uh, favorite authors? Who are your favorite authors? And did any of those readings um, influence you in your decisions to write? Um, this is Tess. Uh, I think that I probably read the same sort of reading list that most female mystery writers grew up reading, and that would be starting off with Nancy Drew. Um, <laughs> I also read a lot of science fiction, Isaac Asimov. Um, and I think there was something about science fiction that appealed to me just because it was the outer reaches of imagination. Um, and, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. Huh. So I think it's the reading list of somebody you know is going to end up writing mysteries. Okay. And did that also influence becoming a doctor? Or? No, it didn't. Um, it, it really didn't. It was, again, I have always managed to have that strange separation in my life between what I was doing as a, you know, my storytelling, my imagination, and the other half of me, which was just plain old curious about science. Okay. And Alyssa, what did you read? I also was a lover of Sherlock Holmes and took a <laughs> great deal of pride in looking immediately at people's knees and their forefingers. <laughs> and I, I well remember being about nine years old and coming to the end of The Hound of the Baskervilles and feeling such visceral terror that I had to leave the, the darkness of my house and go into the light outside in order to finish it because of the thrill that it gave me. So mysteries were very formative for me also. OK. Um, Tess, I was wondering, do you still have a self-concept as a physician, even though you haven't practiced for a while? No, I haven't. I think I lost that quite some time ago. I have not practiced for about 18 years and pretty much self-identify as a writer now. I would hope that there are no emergencies that I have to respond to, because I think I would be a dangerous doctor at this stage. Um, I think I agree with your comments about doctors. Um, in a way, it holds them back from being a writer. You know, we're thought to think in a linear way, and we're that old um, 
uh, phrase, uh, if you hear hoofbeats, think a horse, I think keeps people from taking leaps of imagination. Oh, I think you're, you're right about that. I think that writers should be, should be thinking of zebras. Yeah. That, <laughs> um, that, and that's a large part of storytelling, is always trying to write something that sounds like it would be completely improbable and somehow make it seem as if it could really happen. Mm -hmm. That's... Um, that is a challenge of any thriller writer, any mystery writer, to, to come up with something that um, comes surely out of our imagination and yet make the audience believe that this could really happen or this may really have happened. And now that you've been successful, is your father less worried? <laughs> well, unfortunately, my father had Alzheimer's, so he oh, was unable oh to experience my success. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Alyssa, have you been changed by any of your patient interactions, do you think, as a person? Yes. Um, what I have realized, and I say it over and over again to myself and to anyone who listens these days, is that I work with people who survive conditions and illnesses that I could not survive myself, which um, leads to the dilemma, of course, of how does one treat people who are suffering from things you could not survive yourself, but in my work both um, in the state hospital and state clinics and also in homeless shelters, I see over and over and over again that people's stories, which are not of great interest to them, which become normative, normative for them, are spectacularly courageous and remarkable to me. I have been keeping track a little bit of how many medically ill characters there are in novels. And um, Philip Roth in The Human Stain had a character with prostate cancer. Um, I think Richard Russo in The Straight Man had a, a person, the main character had some prostate problem. I wondered if these two authors had prostate problems, <laughs> but um, I wondered if either of you felt that they would have done better with the novel had they trained medically and known about the disease they were writing about, or whether, in fact, as we've been alluding to or, or thinking about, they might have been freer writing about people with illness because they hadn't been trained. This is Alyssa. I, I have no questions about whether those two writers had prostate problems or not. <laughs> um, and I, I think that the way they would have written before and the way they wrote after is quite different. And I, I find that for myself also that um, though I wrote with what seemed like a feigned wisdom early on, it took my own experience to really comprehend, for instance, Alzheimer's of a relative. Um, you can certainly write it into your fictional character, but you haven't written it into your heart until you have experienced yourself. And that's, that's one of the hazards, is that it comes to appear like we know more than we do because we write about it well. But writing is not the same thing as living. This is Tess, and I, I want to riff off that because you're absolutely, I completely agree with you. These aren't books about diseases, and I think these characters, maybe it, it seems like it's a book about prostate cancer, but they're really books about people and how they respond to some sort of stress in their lives. And it could be prostate cancer, it could be something else, it could be some, some other illness, but what we read these books for is to see how these people react, how they develop, how they change, and how it changes everything around them. So it almost doesn't matter if you're accurate or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make up a completely fictional disease, and I would still be interested in it if the writing is good enough and if the characters are believable enough. So I don't think you would have to be a medical person to write a good book about prostate cancer, mm -hmm. as long as the, the, you know, the story itself was, was riveting. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to ask both of you, um, you've commented on how your writing informs the reader. Um, Anne Hood is a writer who lost a five-year-old to um, an aggressive strep infection. She wrote a fiction book about it. She wrote a nonfiction book about it. And she wrote um, an essay for the New York Times in the Modern Love section, which actually I found to be the most powerful piece about what happened. And um, I got the feeling she kept writing in different genres really to 
help herself. And I wondered if what either of you write about ever helps you. I don't think I would even touch that subject myself. Even though Maura Isles is cutting up people? And <laughs> you know, it, it, there's a difference between cutting up somebody in fiction and writing about the death of a child. I have a couple of, of taboo subjects that I personally will not touch. One of them is, is a child's death because I cannot personally emotionally handle that, um, not even to contemplate it. And that's the kind of a book that I probably would not read because I wouldn't be able to deal with it. So uh, something like that, strangely, I mean, I don't think anybody under, would, would disagree that that's a very difficult topic. But strangely enough, I can read books about people getting cut up on autopsy tables or being uh, slashed to death by serial killers, and it doesn't bother me that much. Um, maybe it's because children and animals hold a special part in our, in our hearts. And Alyssa, I know I read one of your pieces about your father dying, and I wondered if that helped in any way. I found it much easier to write painful pieces when I was younger. Um, and now that I'm older, and uh, I, I, I find it far more poignant. But somebody had said once that writers have one story that they write over and over again in different incarnations. I don't think that's true. For myself, I think I had a story, which was the story of a father's death, until I had a child. And when my child lived to be the age that I was when my father died, and my child's father did not die, I wrote a different story. So I, I think if you live long enough, your stories get to change. And that's, that's a lucky thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, OK. I apologize that I keep looking back at these notes. Um, I guess, Alyssa, I wondered for you, um, is there a tug to writing personal memoir versus medical memoir? Or I see your pieces as medical memoir. You're writing about a, a moment in the past or near past between you and a patient. And in some ways, to me, it feels like memoir. And then when you write about taking a hike with a girlfriend, um, um, a family who's, as in the last piece I read, uh, who takes their patriarch who has Alzheimer's to dinner, and he, I, I don't know how many of you read this, the patriarch gets agitated, and then when he's allowed to put the, uh, his signature on a napkin so he feels he's signing the bill and taking his family out to dinner, he, he calms down and and feels some great feeling again. And um, that piece moved me a great deal. It did me too. I thought it was a great piece. Yeah. That, that, that was not my story. I got to tell that story. Um, but that was the story of a dear friend. And that, that's another thing that I'm most appreciative of, is that after a while, you don't only tell the stories that you see in your own life, but you get these well, you get them from policemen of, about, you know, kids in Russia, and you get them from dear friends, and you kind of, you get to incorporate the greater world, not just the world of oneself. Mm -hmm. That's much richer. I just want to add something to that. I think the real talent, the, the real ability of a storyteller is to identify when it is a good story. Uh, we hear tales all the time. People come up to us and say, I've got a great idea for a book. Um, and I think that it's our job as writers to say, yes, that is a good idea, or no, that would never work. That, I think, is the difference between, in, in a way, a published author and an unpublished author, is that the published author can identify when something is there, when there is a story there, and um, when that idea sparkles. Now, I have a question for you, Tess. You, you said you started writing when you were seven. Uh, were you discriminating in your... <coughs> Did you have the, um, the vibe then? You know, when we talk about, I guess I talk about the vibe, I feel it in my, it's strange, my solar plexus. <laughs> if there was a, a part of the anatomy that judges stories, it's somewhere in my gut. And I can usually pinpoint the exact moment a story is born. Um, as an example, um, I remember that there was an accident aboard the Mir space station some years ago. And there had been a collision with the resupply 
rocket and uh, Mir um, was de decompressing and spinning out of control. And my son said to my husband, what does that mean? And my husband said, I think that means there are three dead men up there. And I had that, that sort of punch in the stomach where I knew there's a story here. And the story may not just, for you it may be, oh my, there's disaster in space. The story for me was immediate in that I knew that the communications were still up, um, that if these men were dying, people on Earth could hear them take their last breaths, that we could hear them dying. And what I was envisioning is somebody on Earth loves these people. And what is it like to know that somebody you care about is beyond your reach and you can hear them die? Um, and I think I was, it was, that was my emotional reaction, is, is the last goodbye. Because I felt that was played out again in John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, where the climbers climbed up, a storm came in, they knew they were going to die, and the last thing one of them did was take out his satellite telephone to call his wife and say goodbye. Imagine that last conversation. So that story that ended up being the book Gravity, yes, it was set aboard a space station, but there was an emotional um, core to that story. I wanted to write a book about what is it like to say goodbye to somebody and not be able to save them. This is Alyssa. That must be a, a kind of a theme that compels all of us. I, I remember hearing a story about uh, a submarine that went down um, many years ago with the submariners still alive, and uh, the Navy tried to rescue them from the outside in and were unable to do so, but they were able to tap on, on, on Morse code. And at a certain point, they were able to tap that they could not help anymore. And from inside came the return tap, we forgive you. Oh. So there is the, the story, there is the horror story, and then there's sort of the rest of the story. Um, and we may be compelled, you and I may be compelled differently a little bit. We, we start with the same story, and then we branch off in different interests. Well, I think that's the art of storytelling. You start with the same premise, and where you take it is what you do as the individual writer. Um, you know, there was another um, premise. I'm sure you would have taken this in a thousand, uh, many different ways, too. And this was in the Boston Globe of a young woman who was found dead in her bathtub. And the investigators showed up and found empty pill bottles and said, clearly an accidental overdose. So they zipped her into a body bag and sent her to the morgue. And a couple hours later, she woke up. And so the story is corpse mistaken for dead. And that was, that, now I knew that was going to be a book. Um, and I talked to writers and I think, well, where would you have taken that story? And everybody has a different direction they want to send it into. But we all, I, we all identify the fact that that premise is very arresting. How do you make that mistake? How do you declare somebody dead when they aren't? And I completely understand how that can happen. Because I, as a resident, have, have been in a situation where, yeah, you walk into the room, the nurses have already called you and said, Mrs. So-and-so has passed away, can you declare them? And the, the family is there wailing, everybody's crying, it's a very uncomfortable situation for an intern to be in. They want to get out of that room as quickly as possible. So they may not listen long enough. Um, so, you know, that's one of the aspects of it that I was envisioning. I was remembering being a resident in that very situation. I Thank heavens, as far as I know, I've never made that mistake, um, but I can see where it would happen. Yeah. No, I actually have. It was, I think, my first day as a pediatric resident. I had to declare a child dead, and I was so nervous. The nurses did say she had died, but I guess they weren't correct because um, <laughs> I said I turned to the parents and said I am so sorry your child has died oh. and the child pulled herself up and said is it time for coca-cola yet <laughs> and <laughs> it was a very um, disturbing moment <laughs> for all of us um, sadly she died a little bit later but she did get her coca-cola which was nice you know um, I, I have another question for for you Tess um, People sometimes ask me if I leave work at the end of the day and or bring it home. And you are someone who's a full-time writer, and you write powerful but disturbing about disturbing things. So do you leave it at 5 o'clock, or does it haunt you, what you write about? I think writing is a 24-7 job. I, I have a feeling you probably feel the same way, is that things kind of keep, keep on echoing in your head. You just can't 
let them go, but then I guess you practice, so maybe that helps <laughs> keep that voice away. <laughs> I, I think I'm hearing voices constantly, characters' voices. I'm always playing around with where stories go. Um, and it's just a matter of the fact that writing novels is so involving and it just takes over your life so much that you can't really walk away from it. So I also was wondering in terms of choice of genre, whether being a doctor um, in any way informed murder mystery format versus essay format um, for you, Alyssa, and for you, Tess. An editor once told me that um, you evolve a word habit. He said, if you're not careful, you're going to become an 800-word writer. <laughs> <laughs> and I have. <laughs> I think it simply informs the scenes and the sense of believability. It really, really does. I have discovered that people um, believe you're an expert if you just use the right language. If you just have the characters speaking the correct lingo, you can make a lot of other mistakes, but they'll believe you know everything. Um, so a large part of what I use as a doctor is just having doctors sound like doctors. Don't have one say to another she had a heart attack, but say she had an MI. Mm -hmm. And that little detail will make them forgive you for a lot of other things. I know Barbara Neely is a murder mystery writer, and she said that she had a political agenda. And she thought, how could I get my political message across um, and have people listen and not get bored in the middle? And she decided that writing a mystery novel with a murder would keep them to the very last moment. And she did such a good job that I read all four of them and didn't realize there was a political message. <laughs> so, but anyway, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, let's see. So uh, at what point did both of you know you would become doctors, um, even though it sounds like the writing bug was inside of both of you in many different ways? But um, at, do, do you know, apart from your father being kind of interested in you becoming a doctor, um, was there some point where it, it clicked and you decided it would work for you? I'm asking both. Uh, well, I think I knew as a freshman in college that I was pre-med. Um, and I learned to, to enjoy the subject matter, the science, certainly. Um, I found medicine itself very stressful. I found it emotionally stressful. And when my children came, I found I, I had the most problem really juggling motherhood with practicing medicine. Um, a large part of that had to do with the lack of child care. Um, but again, a lot of it had to do with just the stress of watching people die. Mm -hmm. This is Alyssa. I had no interest in medicine whatsoever. Um, I sidestepped into it after my stepfather explained to me that you could not be a full-time writer, that I would either need to take some science classes or learn to type, because, <laughs> because there was always room for science journalism and there was always room for someone who could do 200 words per minute. <laughs> So do your children, both Tess and Alyssa, uh, get confused as to where your heart, heart's desire is or what, what work you're doing? You know, it's hard enough to explain what doctors do, what writers do. Uh, to be both must be quite puzzling well, to the children. This is, this is Tess. Uh, they've only known me, really, in their, in their you know, conscious lives as mm -hmm. a writer. Um, I think that what is hard for them to reconcile is the fact that I write such disturbing fiction <laughs> because they, they hear comments from their friends. And I remember my son coming home one day and said, my roommate read your book and said, dude, your mom's sick. <laughs> so that, that was really the only thing I've had to deal with. I have a 12-year-old, and uh, my life is the last thing on her mind. <laughs> <laughs> So Alyssa, I was wondering, do you see less um, psychiatrically ill patients, or are you mainly with a psychotic population? Or? No, I, I 
uh, I, I only work with the Department of Mental Health, which takes um, very ill patients, primarily psychotic, bipolar, and then I work in the shelter a couple of nights a, a week doing outreach. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, do you uh, ever offer writing as a therapeutic intervention for them? It certainly should be. And I, and I sometimes ask people if they've written things down. Um, but it, we, I haven't formalized it. It's a very good suggestion. I think I've come to the end of my questions. Um, if people could line up. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Tess Gerritsen. Uh, given the tremendously rapid progress in medicine every few years, so much information changes and turns over, uh, does that have any impact on your uh, authenticity of what you write in your stories, or does it not matter to you that, uh, what, how do you keep up, if you do keep mm -hmm. up, how do you manage to do that, and if you don't, does it matter? Um, it matters to me for particular scenes. If, for instance, I'm going to have a code blue scene, I need to be up on the drug, so I do the research for that. Um, a lot of my medical detail has to do with forensic pathology these days, since one of my continuing characters is a, is a forensic pathologist in Boston. Um, so what I do is I keep up with the journal Forensic Sciences and um, want to be as cutting edge as possible as, as I can be. The other a solution to that problem of continuing, continually having medicine uh, advance is uh, I did go backwards in time and did a book set in 1830s, so I was able to look at medicine back then. Um, then you don't have to worry about <laughs> advances. <clears throat> Dr. Eli, um, Eli, sorry. I'm a psychiatrist here in Cambridge, and I've waited this opportunity for years <laughs> to tell you of the great, great bunch of fans you have here, of your article in the Boston Globe. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't have a question, really. What I was thinking <laughs> <laughs> But I can just imagine working with so many people who are mute and catatonic and can't speak. You probably tell them stories, and I bet you're like their mother. And they must listen to you because you have such compassion and caring for the subjects you write about. You're a wonderful writer and obviously a wonderful psychiatrist. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> there, there. Thank you. There is um, a psychiatrist who I trained with who, with his sicker patients, used to reveal quite a lot about himself, and he once had a mute and catatonic patient, and he sat with her, and he told her about where he had been over the weekend, which was at the wedding of uh, one of his children. And after he had conversed in a one-sided way with her, she told him her secret. So th there are all kinds of theories about disclosure and, um, and level of intimacy, but I, I think there's a lot to be said for being as genuine as possible with the people that we work with. And this is for Alyssa, of course. I've, written, I've read your writing since before you became a doctor. It was, you haven't changed at all. It was as poignant and as, as, as crystalline as it always has been. I noticed in the echoes of what you were reading uh, some of the uh, ways that, that affected my writing for over the years. And later, I actually had a student who went through Boston College, became a writer, and writes for the Globe. And those echoes I see in her writing that came from your writing. <laughs> And I don't know if it's true, but I always got the feeling that you became a doctor because the compassion you had for those people you were writing for in the early days at the Fessenden School and, the, and Dana Farber. And yes, I have collected every one of your columns just like that other woman did. And so my question is simply this, when are you going to publish the collection? Um. I don't think the world needs another collection, <laughs> but thank you, Laurie, for asking. 
to push the question of the interface between writing and medicine in a slightly different direction. Um, as a psychiatrist who is trying to learn how to write fiction, uh, I've found that the uh, business of trying to imagine a character in a situation of stress or conflict uh, is not too different from uh, sitting with a patient and trying to empathically understand what the patient is talking about or going through. Uh, and I wonder if uh, either of you have, uh, or how either of you have uh, experienced and used that uh, parallel uh, and what differences you find between uh, empathy for patients and empathy for characters. There's a big connection. This is Tess. It's a big connection, but, and I think that a large part of, of good fiction writing has to be um, the ability to crawl into somebody's head and see it through their eyes. Uh, if you cannot do that, you can't imagine what they're feeling, what they're, um, what is going on to their bodies, the fact that their heart is pounding, their hands are sweating. You just have to be able to almost be a method actor. And I think that a good psychiatrist would certainly be that kind of a person. This is Alyssa. Um, I was just reading this afternoon about mirror neurons, which are these remarkable um, systems of neurons in various parts of the brain that cause one to feel and to learn how to feel based on the feelings one observes in others. And that may be some of the neurobiological foundation for empathy. So it may not be only that we feel it in our hearts, but that we also feel it in our brains. And, and perhaps that's why it won't be so hard for you to write your fiction. Dr. Eli, I was wondering if you feel any need to embellish on the facts in your stories in order to make them more interesting? Oh. <laughs> well, I, I don't embellish on them to make them more interesting, but I do feel I, uh, a, an obligation to hide the, the reality of the characters, so I do whatever is necessary to make sure that they're not recognizable and I change demographics regularly. I, would you call that an embellishment? Yeah, yeah you would? Yeah. Yeah. I then guess I do. I'd like to, uh, uh, this is Sasha again, um, both, both for Tess, um, and since Alyssa and I are both psychiatrists, I was just wondering if you ever felt any of your characters needed a psychiatrist. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the most interesting characters do need psychiatrists. <laughs> I, my rule of thumb is if they're, they're, they are not going through a crisis or a conflict in their lives, they're not very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that we, as storytellers are always hunting for a bigger, bigger, bigger crisis and a bigger conflict. So I've, good fiction is littered with psychiatric patients. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. I'm a medical student who writes, and I hope to one day be a doctor who writes, so I wanted to thank you. This is very inspirational for me to hear from all of you. Um, related, actually, to the previous question, I was wondering if you could reflect on your use of patient stories and patient information in your writing to make it rich and make it complex, as you've said, and how that um, goes along with having obtained that information in a different setting in the context of a therapeutic relationship, both for matters of privacy, as you mentioned, Dr. Eli, but also in terms of uh, the patient's ultimate benefit, your ultimate benefit, um, issues like that. Yeah, I, I ponder and worry about that increasingly, not just because of the dreaded HIPAA, but um, because one doesn't want to take advantage Interestingly, patients have never asked me that question. Um, doctors have and therapists have, but my experience with patients has been that they do recognize themselves, even if others don't recognize them, and that they tend to be very pleased that someone has written about them. Um, probably because I don't write very often about patients that I dislike or disrespect. So I've not had personal trouble, but I certainly understand that it's, it's a pretty consuming ethical question and one you'll be grappling with. 
Do you ask for their permission to write about them? And if so, at what point in the process? There's been a lot of thinking about this. Um, I, I know that, um, Sasha, in the journal that you write for, this has been come up in a number of editorial pieces. I do not ask for permission. Um, <clears throat> and I and I make that decision and may die on that sword. Um, but I do know a number of doctors who generally treat much higher functioning patients who will say at the beginning, I, I want you to know that I'm a writer and that there are times when I will disguise things, but I can't guarantee that I'll never not write about you. I've also known some psychiatrists who show their writings to their patients before they're published. Um, I'm not one of them. Um, this is Sasha. Just to comment on that, um, I write often about children and their parents, and I, um, except for once, I do not get permission. And um, I also disguise everything. I don't think any of the cases I've written about would be recognizable. It, working with children, it becomes a little bit harder because changing gender or age may change the whole story because they're in a different developmental phase or grappling with different issues. But um, I, try, I try my best to disguise as much as I can or take the kernel from what's happened in reality and then become a novelist and make up a whole story. But that has the salient features and points that I want to demonstrate. This is Tess. This story, this problem will come up even if you don't write medical fiction. People are always going to recognize themselves or think they recognize themselves in your fiction and will accuse you of this or accuse you of that. Um, I think that disguising things such as gender or location, um, it, that's one way to do it, but sometimes you, <clears throat> I think the personality shows through and uh, somebody's going to get mad. Um, so I'm an oncologist, a psychiatrist of sort, in a sense. So it's a question about what you had mentioned earlier, Tess, about the barriers to physicians being writing. And, and it actually resonated. I think there's a lot of truth to this. My question is, do you find that the patients who you might have the most, or for either of you, the most deep emotional connection with, that that becomes a barrier to either fictionalizing them or writing about them, actually? Um, or do you find that the patients you ultimately writing about are the ones that you indeed have the deepest emotional connection with? This Any is, of you? This so. is Tess. I find that the, pay, that the the characters I have the deepest emotional connection with are ones I created out of whole cloth. If I know them, I feel constrained by reality to put everything down I know about them right from, from this scar to the way they look. Uh, if I create them, they're almost ch my own children, and I become much more attached to them by the time the book is over. I certainly write better when I'm more compelled by someone and probably write a lot worse when I'm not. What's come to worry me these days is writing about someone and then their story goes on, but the story I've told doesn't. And I can give you an example. I, I wrote a story a number of years ago about a gentleman in the homeless shelter who had mild mental retardation, and we couldn't find anywhere to place him, but he was always grateful for the life he had led, and he would talk to us about the birds and the all kinds of nature that he saw, and he always described himself as a lucky man. And it was a very, you know, it was a touching piece, and people were touched by it. And I was touched by it. I thought it was a touching piece. And then uh, the piece was published, and his life went on, and things got a lot worse for him. And, and in fact, he was ultimately institutionalized, and um, his, he has no freedoms at all, and the nature and the birds that he had lived for are not available to him anymore. So the, I'm slanting your question and, and just kind of, um, and just drifting off into space on it mm -hmm. here, but I, I, worry less about whether I make a connection with people and then write about them, and more about what happens when they've been written about and yet their lives continue. And, and I also worry that when I've made a great connection with them, I romanticize them. 
and their lives. And in so doing, that's a disservice to them. See, I think t that your, your essays compared to Oliver Sacks don't romanticize. I mean, I think I take offense now. I, I used to like Oliver Sacks, but when he writes about his severely retarded child who can walk across a stage and do some kind of performance, but then you know she's going back to a home where she can barely function, that to me is romanticizing it, and it makes me angry at Oliver Sacks because uh, he's not painting the full picture, and I'm not sure what point he's making anymore either, but I don't get the sense that you've romanticized well, Here. telling a story is not always painting the full picture. Writing a novel may be painting the full picture, but writing a little essay is not the full picture. I also wanted to say with the oncology patients that um, the, actually I did, treat, I did consult liaison to children with cancer, and um, it was long before I ever wrote anything. And the one piece I wrote about a dying child was the child I felt the most for and felt the greatest connection to. And it was perhaps 12, 15 years later when I started writing, and I knew I had to write about this child. Um, it, was, it was a mandate inside me. I could not not write about this child. But, but you had to wait 12 to 15 years to do it? Oh, well, it, at that point, then, I was beginning to see that I could, could write. And, and then it, it, I just knew that that was a person I had to write about. There's an interesting phenomenon I hear from other authors, that they cannot write about a city if they're actually in it. They have to go away. And then somehow it becomes more real to them from a distance. Because when they're right there, they're overwhelmed by details. And really, when you want to write about something, you can't put in every detail. What you have to do is get the gist of it, get the, you know, the overall sense of it, and you need to be away from that and have it in your memory first. And I'll just make one comment, because that's been my observation as well, is that if you're too connected to it, sometimes that's the worst writing in a way, is that you need some distance. And that's why I thought your comment about the barriers to physicians writing, that there's a strange balance between being highly emotional so you can express a story, but not too emotional, because then it's not a good story. So that was my only other comment. So. And this is Sasha again for Tess. I, I do know that... Um, the nub of your stories and the mystery part is very important, but I know that what draws me to keep buying the next book is to find out what happens to Jane and to Maura. <laughs> and so just like in psychiatry, when each week or more than once a week a patient comes in to tell their tale, and I'm waiting, thinking, what will I hear next? That's what I'm waiting for for your <laughs> well, next book. I, and I, I didn't realize that when I started writing a series, which I had not planned to write to begin with, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to how the series began. It started off with a book called The Surgeon, which was about a serial killer who identifies his victims by their blood tests. He chooses his victims based on something to do with their blood tests. And I introduced a character there, Detective Jane Rizzoli, who was supposed to die in that book. And as many characters do in my books, they, they start to misbehave somewhere <laughs> during the writing of it. And when I got to the final scene where she was supposed to die, she fought back and refused to be killed. Um, so that book ended, and I'll, I'll, I wanted to find out more about what was going to happen to her, so I wrote a sequel. And by that time, you know, once you start getting invested in people who don't even exist, uh, you just can't let them go. And for me, every book that I've written has been about a mystery, but even more, it's been about what happens next in their lives. And so, you know, you can... You can explore a character pretty well in a book, but you can explore them even better over a course of eight books. <laughs> it just so happens that you're the second doctor who became an author. The, the author of The Kite Runner is, was also oh, a doctor. Seen, yeah. yes. And to me, the doctor is the highest of the professions, and you chose to be a, a writer. And I say, do you ever get the feeling that I'm missing something? I, I not doing, I'm not doing all I can do for the society. For humanity. Right. You know, I, I, do, I do get that feeling sometimes during, during periods of great unrest. For instance, right after 
I had this feeling, what am I doing at home writing about this? I should be out there doing something. Um, but I think that I've, I've learned that the reason I really left had to do with personal issues, with my having to be a mother, the children issue. And I also find when I talk to physicians that many of them are not that happy. There was a survey done by Medical Economics some decades ago asking doctors, if you had another possibility for an occupation and it would pay as much as you're doing now, you're getting now, would you change? About half of doctors said they would. So it gives you an idea that the practice of medicine may be, it may seem like the most wonderful and most rewarding, and in an emotional way it is, but it is also quite stressful to a number of physicians. Uh, when I talk about that, the course I, I teach every year for doctors who want to be writers, I often ask them, why are you here? And some of them will say, well, I want to write a book, but many of them will say, I want to get out of medicine, which is sad. I was reading in the Upper Times some research that studied people who, had, had, who were able to write down their feelings and so on and so forth. And I imagine being a doctor, you have a lot of feelings. And are there any courses to like encourage doctors to write their feelings after certain experiences to help them uh, clear the stress that's in them all the time? That should be a medical school course. I think that should be required. Uh, journal keeping. Um, something to do with, you know, there's, you want to have, have them get a sense that they, they can express themselves and also that's, that ability to get rid of the stress. I think it'd be a great idea for medical schools. Oh, it's not just an idea. Uh, I, uh, there are many medical schools that do have such courses. Mm -hmm. uh, I think NYU has certainly been in the lead in, in this field. Uh, with using uh, writing about, about uh, students and, and residents' experiences and physicians' experiences as, as a way to get them in touch with uh, both their own personal feelings and experiences, but also with the, the major issues in medicine. Uh, I believe Harvard Medical School has such a course. I believe these are all pretty much elective courses. I may be wrong, and someone else may want to correct me about that. Uh, and I sort of think about my own case, why I came so late to writing. And you have to do it when you're ready to do it, I think is the answer. Uh, in my own case, uh, I, I was uh, sort of like you, highly oriented toward the science of medicine for decades, and then uh, finally switched off in another direction. And I think that's, that's probably a very personal thing for each uh, student and each resident and each uh, physician, is the writing has to happen when the writing is is ready to happen, but uh, I think when it does happen, it can just uh, add so much to the experience of medicine uh, whenever it happens. Uh, listening to you talk tonight, I've been you know, reflecting on how, as a physician, you have a profession with a strong sense of purpose, um, for many physicians, I think, and as writers, um, do you have um, a strong um, sense when you finish a piece of writing what you hope the reader takes away from it? This is Tess. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and every book elicits an emotional reaction in myself. For instance, I had a book called The Bone Garden, which was about 1830s medicine and Oliver Wendell Holmes and childbed fever. And that book was completely inspired by my own horror of the disease childbed fever and what how many thousands of women suffered and died of it because of physician errors because back then doctors did not know they had to wash their hands they were killing women left and right and i wanted to look back at medicine when doctors thought they were doing the right thing and were in fact harming their patients um, i wanted people to come away with that thinking not only thank god i don't live back then but also to understand that all the mistakes that doctors have made through the centuries, through the decades, have been with the purest of motives. They have wanted to help their patients, and yet they have caused harm. And what are we doing now as physicians? You know, how many practices are we doing now that are really hurting our patients? So um, I think that was, that was the sense I wanted people to get out of it. But 
because I write popular fiction, I had to couch it in a different way. I had to put a serial killer in the story first. Um, and in a sense, I think that whenever we sit down to write a book, we're doing two things. We're telling a story, but we also have a secret theme that's in our own head that we want to convey, like that political theme that you never got because you were so busy reading the mystery. Um, and, and that's what we struggle with, is, is how do you balance all these various elements in fiction, and, how, and you just hope that your reader picks it up, and very often they don't. I don't know. When I read that scene, that first scene um, in, the, in the Bone Garden where the doctor was going from patient to patient and wiping his hands on the towel, I got that one. <laughs> um, deeply. But I wonder, Alyssa, if you have something when you write a piece, when you finish it, do you, do you hope that someone takes away from it? Or do you have an idea in your head of what someone will take away? Uh, I don't. I don't have any grand hopes. I'm very pleased when someone laughs, and I'm very pleased when someone's touched. Thank you. Um, I had one more comment, and then we'll come to a close. Um, this was about the idea of keeping a journal, or um, the um, something that dovetails with that, which is to do a lot of reading, which Tess was mentioning that sometimes she asks. Uh, doctor authors to be what their last book read was, what, what novels have they read, what fiction, nonfiction, and they haven't done much reading. <laughs> and um, I did write one essay, a couple of essays at one point in time where I felt very strongly that doctors might learn more from fiction than from textbooks. And one example that I found was um, I had read The Imp of the Mind, which is about OCD. And then I read a book by Mark Saltzman, a novel that was called The Celloist, um, or The Soloist, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, it was a prodigy celloist who developed OCD. And he could no longer play, because every time he played one note, he heard it wrong and had to repeat the note. And I kept thinking, you know, where am I learning more about OCD, from Mark Saltzman, the fiction writer, or from medical school? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I guess the same can go from, uh, for reading Alyssa and Tess. Uh, yeah, this is Tess. I wanted to just make one comment about that, because that's really interesting. I, I feel that fiction sometimes reaches reality far better than a textbook ever could. Um, I just blogged about this topic, by the way, because I remembered it was 90, 1994 when Tom Clancy wrote that thriller about the airplane that crashes into the Capitol building and kills everybody. And then September 11th happened, and the US government said, oh my god, we should be asking novelists to come up with, you know, use their imagination to come up with ways we can, ide we can defend ourselves. And um, I got a call last week, a couple weeks ago, from a criminal investigator asking me how I knew so much about this particular serial killer and had I been talking to somebody they should know about. <laughs> and I responded, no, I made that one up entirely in my own head. But she said, step by step by step, I had described the crime scene and his method. So this is a case where pure fiction can get just as close to reality as a textbook can. Here, here. <laughs> So thank you, Alyssa Eli. Thank you, Tess Gerritsen.